Hello and welcome to a Powerline Systems video on using the steel pole shaft and tubular steel davit arm optimizers. With the release of version 16.80 of the software, the optimum tubular steel davit arm size can be found based on the user's input parameters. Steel pole shaft optimization has been available for much longer, but will also be covered in this video as the concepts are similar. Steel pole optimization is a great tool to help with estimating early on in a project. Users can estimate steel weight for bidding or shipping purposes, or can use the weight to verify that the construction equipment available will be sufficient for hoisting or handling materials. Another use is to prevent engineered structures from appearing overutilized in the initial stages of design. Keep in mind that your manufacturer may have proprietary design practices or steel plate availability. Your optimized design will likely not perfectly match the design that comes from the manufacturer. I'll start this model with an already built pole model. My loads in my LCA file are either from my PLS CAD model, or the loads were provided depending on whether I am a line designer or a steel pole manufacturer. When I analyze this model by going to Model, Run, I see a lot of red. My pole is overstressed, my arms are overstressed, and the current design is not a reasonable representation of what the final dimensions will be. I can also see that my deflection limit has been exceeded. PLS pole will use the deflection specified in our LCA file as one of the parameters when optimizing the steel pole shaft. First I'll walk through pole optimization and then tubular davit arm optimization. To start with pole optimization, I'll first cover the properties of the steel pole. When we optimize a pole, we are going to be either creating a new pole property or overwriting an existing property. Either way, we need to start with the pole properties that are currently modeled. I'll navigate to Components, Steel Pole. In this model, I have a property label of SP Prop 1. My pole height is set at 118.5 feet with a default embedment length of 0 and a steel shape of 12F. These properties will not change during the optimization. They will be maintained and used to find the optimum pole size. This pole, for example, does have an embedment override, which will be maintained during the optimization. The default drag coefficient, modulus of elasticity override, weight density override, shape at base, strength check type, and texture also remain the same as the property used for optimization. The properties that will change are my tip and base diameters, taper, and tube geometry. One thing I'll point out about tubes is that the lap length will be held constant if a number is input, and you will receive a warning about a less than optimum design after performing an optimization. Tube thickness and length can change, but lap length will remain constant. If you input a lap factor, keep in mind this is based on the diameter of the pole. The height will be maintained, but the lap length will be adjusted. I have included these concepts into this optimization. For my top tube to bottom tube joint, I will specify a lap length of 2 feet. This lap value will be maintained during the optimization, and we will receive a warning about this when we run the optimizer. For the middle to bottom pole joint, I have specified a lap factor of 1.5. This will always maintain a lap length of 1.5 times the inner diameter of the tube. Pole lengths will be adjusted to accommodate this setting. A word of warning about lap lengths. ASCE 48 specifies how slip jointed poles are designed regarding lap lengths. There is no issue using either option to specify the lap length, but specifying a set lap length may result in a design that does not meet these requirements. To optimize the pole, I'll go to Model, Steel Pole Shaft Optimizer, or I can use the context menu, which I will do for the arms. We are first given the steel pole to optimize. This is useful if you have a multi-pole structure. You will also be given the option to apply the optimization to all poles in the model if there are multiple. The second box is the name of the new property, and if an existing property label is entered here, the property will be overwritten. I'll name this property STR100-OPT1 to denote that this is my optimized design for structure 100. I have two options for defining plate thickness. If I am a vendor or have a good idea about what plate thicknesses are available for the pole manufacturer, I can use the user input thickness option. 
This will allow me to enter up to 32 discrete steel plate thicknesses in the area now available on the right side of the dialog. Since I do not have knowledge of a vendor's plate inventory, I will use the minimum, maximum, and increment option and allow the program to determine the thickness of steel. The next field is where I will specify my pole dimension parameters. During the pole optimization process, PLS pole will look for the lightest pole possible. This results in a pole with a wide base and a narrow tip. In the real world, this is not always the best solution. Poles are less aesthetically pleasing, foundations get more expensive, and pole base encroachment on adjacent utilities or roadways are good reasons to control the base diameter of the pole. In this example, I want to avoid unreasonably small tip diameter, so I will use a minimum tip diameter of 12 inches and leave the maximum at 36 inches. There may also be a conflict that restricts my base diameter to 4 feet, so I'll set my minimum base diameter to 24 inches and the maximum base diameter to 48 inches. I'll leave the increment where it's at, which is 1 inch for both. A larger increment will solve faster, but could result in a less optimum design. A smaller increment will take longer to solve, but result in a more optimum design. The steel thickness is the third input. I'll leave my minimum thickness of 1 8 of an inch, max thickness of 1 half of an inch, and increment of 1 16th of an inch. Again, the larger the number of increments, the longer it will take to find a solution. If I am unsure of the decimal equivalent for a fraction, most cells in pole allow you to use an equation in the input field. For example, my 1 16th of an inch increment can be specified by entering equal sign 1 divided by 16 into the input field, and the decimal equivalent will be populated. I will leave my minimum and maximum taper fields blank. The larger the taper, the more conical the pole will look. There are also tooltips that can be found in most fields that explain how that field affects the design. The last option is the W over T ratio, or pole flat width over the thickness. This value relates to buckling and will not be exceeded during the optimization if a value is input. I will leave this blank as well. If I would like to see a detailed list of all solutions tried, I can check the box before running my optimization. There can be upwards of thousands of iterations, so I will leave this unchecked. After I click OK, I get the warning that I previously mentioned. My pole design may not be optimized if I have a specified lap length that is longer than what is required based on the diameter of the pole. I am OK with this, so I will click Yes to close the warning. Once my analysis is complete, I will see an optimization report. I can see my inputs for maximum and minimum diameters, and my steel thickness. It also states that taper and W over T ratio were not constraints. Below the image of my pole, I am given the best design summary. I can also see my optimized steel pole component information. I don't have a need for this report right now, so I will close it. Now we can see that the pole is larger than it was prior to running the optimization. I can also go back to components, steel pole, and see that my new property is in use and that my dimensions match what was reported after my optimization. I'll jump into my tube dialog to show that my pole is still 118.5 feet, even though my pole bottom section has changed in length when compared to the initial property. Now I will move on to tubular debit arm optimization. I'll again start with my component library found at Components, Tubular Steel Davit Arms. When performing an optimization for tubular davit arms, much like steel pole shaft, my steel shape, drag coefficient, MOE, strength check, and yield stress will not be affected. We are going to be optimizing the dimensions of thickness, base, and tip diameters. The geometry of the arms will also not be changed. While more efficient designs may be found with upswept or curved arms, the optimizer will only consider the current arm geometry. In this example, I would like to give all arms on the left side of the pole the same property, the shield wire arms the same property, and all arms on the right side of the pole the same property. I will have the option to apply this new property to all arms that share the property label for the arm I am optimizing. You can see in the geometry menu that my shield wire, right, and left side davit arms share the property label with their similar arms. This makes it possible to optimize similar arms at the same time. 
I'll start with arm TD9 as this is my left shield wire arm and had the highest usage of the two shield wire arms. You can note the usage of the arms in the status bar as I snap between the arms. If I choose the arm with the lower usage and apply that property to both arms, I will still have an overutilized arm as the load used for optimization is based on the arm chosen. To run the David Arm Optimizer, I can navigate to Model, Tubular Steel David Arm Optimizer, or I can use the Context option by snapping to the arm, left clicking, and selecting Tubular Steel David Arm Optimizer. The first option we have is to select the arm to optimize. Pull will look for the properties for this arm and change the dimensions of this property label. The second is where we specify our new property label. I will use SWARM-OPT for this property. Something to note about tubular David arms is that the optimizer will not overwrite properties as it will for the pole shaft optimizer. Next we'll choose our base and tip diameters. As with the pole shaft we want to choose something that will be both appealing and sensible. Like the pole shaft the arm will be optimized to find the lightest option which will create a wide base and a narrow tip. Instead I'll use the pole diameter as a point of reference for my example. I know the pole diameter is 12 inches at the tip, so I'll use something smaller. I'll input 4 inches for the minimum tip diameter and 6 inches for the maximum. For the arm base diameter, where the arm connects to the pole, I'll set the minimum at 5 inches and the maximum at 8 inches. Again, your experience may lead to a different way of going about this, but ultimately the manufacturer will use their own design methods to design these elements. I will leave the increment for these as 1 inch to reduce the number of iterations the software performs. For thicknesses, I will input 1 16th of an inch for the minimum. Again, if I'm not positive about the decimal that this is equal to, I can use the input field as a calculator. I'll enter equals 1 over 16, which then populates the box with 0 0.0625. And I will increment 1 16th of an inch and I will not specify a maximum W over T ratio. I also do not need to see a list of potential solutions for this optimization. When I click OK, I will be asked if I would like to use this optimization for all arms with the same property. As I pointed out before, I'm going to optimize similar arms to be the same. It was important that prior to running the optimization, I set my model up so all arms will optimize at the same time. If the goal is to individually optimize arms, you can choose no. It's also important if arms are going to be optimized together that you choose to optimize the arm with the highest loads, which is why I reviewed the arm usages prior to optimizing an arm. Once the optimizer has run, we can see our report, which is very similar to our pole shaft optimization report. I will now go back to the original deformed geometry, and this time I'll focus on the left side of the structure. I can see that my top arm, TD6 has the highest usage between the arms on the left side, so I will use that for optimization. In my structure view, I'll use the context menu to bring up the optimizer. I will name this arm LTCOND-OPT for the left side conductor arm optimization. I won't make any changes to my optimization settings, and I will run the optimizer again, clicking yes to optimize all arms with the same property. I'll perform these same steps for the right side. The top arm, TD2, in this case has the highest usage. Using the context menu, I'll open the optimizer and name this property RTCOND-OPT. For this arm, maybe I want to keep the base diameter of the arm the same as the left side arms. If this is the case, I need to restrict my allowable base diameter Instead of giving a range of 5 inches to 8 inches, I'll set both my minimum and my maximum values to 8 inches. Click OK to optimize all arms. Now, I will close my previous deformed geometry view and perform a structure check using Model Run. I can see that my structure has been totally optimized. I can now, for example, go to the tube summary in my summary report to get a reasonable estimate of the weight for each of my tubes, and I can do the same for arms. I can now save this model, and each time I run a structure analysis in PLSCAD, the usage for the structure will show 99% usage, 
which works as a placeholder until the manufacturer's pull properties can be substituted in the future. If you'd like more information about our software, please see our website at www.powerlinesystems.com or contact us at info at powline.com. To receive a quote for purchase or renewal of your license, please contact sales at powline.com. And for any technical inquiries, please contact support at powline.com. Thank you for watching and for your interest in our software, the industry standard in overhead line design.